Thank you very much for coming. My name is Vittorio Romeo. I currently work at Bloomberg as a software engineer. And you might know me for my video tutorials and my other conference talk. Today, we're going to speak about static control flow in C14. And this is what we're going to do. So I have a part that's just slides. And there we're going to look at static control flow in general. Then we're going to learn about compile time branching. And we'll have a little history lesson about static if in C. We're going to take a look at if const export in C17. And then implement our own version in C14. Then we're going to switch to code and comments. And we'll see the implementation details of static if. And we'll also deal with compile time iteration using two different techniques. For each argument, which you may know if, you have, uh, if you're following Sean Parent on Twitter, and static for, which is a glorified fold with a lot of syntactical sugar. So what is static control for? So static is a specifier that has multiple meanings in C++, but it's also a word very commonly used by developers to refer to compile time control flow. Languages such as D, if you have ever, ever used it, you should know it as a very, very powerful metaprogramming facility called static if. And there are also other languages that do that. The goals of this talk are understanding the benefits of static control flow, looking at the history of static if in C++, and also analyzing the constructs we're going to implement in C14. Let's start with an example of another language. So this is static if in D. If you look at this, it's pretty weird, because as you can see, we're kind of having this kind of template where we're passing a compile time integer. And we are compiling different aliases depending on the integer we passed. And we also have a static assert over there, which will only fire if the conditions are not met. So in this case, you can think about the uh, co the decompiler completely ignoring branches that are not matched by the conditions. So how would you implement this in C++? Anyone? OK, yeah, that's probably the easiest way of implementing it. You just have a normal template, and you specialize it over the integer. And as you can already see the difference. So in D, it's very, it doesn't care about the scopes. Well, in C++, it's easier to understand because the compiler has to uh, specialize between the two templates, and there are no weird rules about static if. This is an example from C++11, where we have a variadic function called f. And this is the traditional way of handling with uh, a variadic pack of arguments. We usually have a single step that handles one of the arguments. And then we have uh, the variadic version that calls the single argument function and then handles the tail and keeps repeating until the tail is empty. So as you can see, we have to repeat that function twice. If we had some sort of construct, maybe called if const expert, we could avoid defining two functions and we could do something like this. This is very nice because it's localized. We have the single function call, and then we handle the tail only if it's not empty. So it's quite easier to read and to maintain, as we have a single function. Another example is constructing objects. Let's say we're building our own version of make unique. And what we want to do is switch between braces initialization and run parentheses initialization that allows implicit conversion and all the stuff. And if we want to check data compile time, we might use something like this, which is enable if. Or if you're using some nice library such as fit or HANA, you would do something clever. But as you can see, we have two, two versions of the same function. And it's really noisy because we have all that enable if stuff. If again, we had this magical construct called if const expert, all of that would go away. And what we would, we would have is just a single function, which is really, really straightforward and easy to read. And as you can see, we're switching between uh, a compile conditions, a compile time condition, and just returning depending on the result of that condition. So those examples are actually real examples that were taken from this proposal over here by Vil Vultanin. And it's, it was called Constact If. And the paper was originally called, created as a resurrection of two very controversial static if proposals by Walter E. Brown and Walter Bright, uh, Herb Sader, and Alexandrescu. So these proposals were created in 2011 and 2012. And they were considered harmful by Bjarne, Gabi, and Andrew Sutter because they had very unintuitive scope rules. They were similar to the static if, and they weren't you know, consistent with the rest of the language. In 2015, we had this static if resurrected proposal that changed the name to context per if and made it more in line with the rest of the language. So uh, Will improved the proposal several times. And 
In 2015, we got two more proposals that improved the wording. And in 2016, we finally got to uh, the version that you've seen on the screen with the if constructor syntax. In Ulu, we got the final revision. It was accepted for C17, and I'm really happy to announce that you will be able to write that beautiful code pretty soon, hopefully. So these are is the same examples seen before, and this is valid C17. You can write this if you have a C17 compliant compiler, and I think that Clang SVN should be able to, do, to handle this quite nicely. And again, this example that we've seen before is not hypothetical. You can write this in C17. There are some rules. So if constexpr is always restricted to block scopes, it's always going to establish a new scope, and it requires that exists value of the condition so that either condition branch is worth formed. So the first two rules can be summarized as that, um, you know, if you ever use the normal if statement, you, need, you will introduce a new scope. You cannot do crazy stuff like D. So everything that you do inside the scope is going to be limited to that scope. The third rule is the most important one, and it says that practically all the branches need to be is parsable, and they will only be instantiated if the condition is matching. So as long as you have valid C++ code in there, even if, it's, um, even if the class maybe does not support an operation that you're calling inside the branch, the branch will only be instantiated and cause a compiled error if the condition is matching. Otherwise, it just needs to be well-formed. Doesn't matter if we, if we will compile if the condition is not true. So if you remember this, no, we cannot do that in C++. And I, I think that's a good thing. You can chain together if constexpr like this, which is very nice to see. And the question that you're all asking is, do we, wait, do we have to wait until C++ 17 to do something like this? And if you're here, Obviously, you're interested in a C14 solution, which we can implement with a slightly less enticing syntax. So let's get to the C14 construct. And I want to start with an example. Let's say we have multiple food-related classes that have slightly different interfaces. So we have a banana and peanuts that we can eat, and then we have water and juice that we can drink. Our goal is to create a generic consume function that will accept any kind of food instance and will print something to a CD out depending on the type of the food. One way we could do this is uh, using if constexpr or my static if implementation. And what we need is obviously a compile time condition in order to branch a compile time. So we can specialize some C14 variadic uh, uh, variables in order to categorize these classes. And you can think of this as manually having a concept and manually specifying what is satisfying the concept. So in the case of this solid concept, we're specifying that banana and peanuts should satisfy it. And for the, is liquid with doing that for water and juice. Once we have that and our magical static if in C14, we can write something like this. So this is quite weird. It's like a chain of lambdas with some synthetical sugar in between that allows you to implement something that's completely equivalent to C17 if comes expert uh, construct. So as you can see, we're using this weird bool v, which is a, var a variable template that allows us to wrap the Boolean value in a compile time wrapper so that the branching can take place. And yeah, that's what bool v is for. And it is implemented like this. We have a, an interval constant and a concept uh, variable template in order to make it a little nicer so we don't have to use the braces at the end. Afterwards, uh, I'd like to say that this kind of idea of wrapping types in, inside values and vice versa is what allows amazing libraries such as Boostana or Fit and Take to create extremely powerful and nice to use metaprogramming facilities. And you can learn more about, about this pattern in the links here. The slides are available on GitHub, so feel free to check them out later and you can click on the links and visit the, the articles. Also, you can see that the scope rules are what you would expect because we have those lambdas that are restricting the logic of the branching only inside that scopes. And the idea of thinking about this construct is that every branch is like a template function that will only be instantiated if the condition is matching. So it doesn't matter if, for example, y uh, dot it does not exist for our current uh, x in the consume call because we, no, we won't get a compilation error unless the branch is instantiated. So that means that the condition should have matched. So yeah, you can think about this as a bunch of template function, and we're like, 
linearly searching the one that matches. And as soon as we find it, we take it and we instantiate it. Otherwise, it's never going to be instantiated. So this pattern works thanks to C++14's generic lambdas. This is one of uh, the branches. And the compiler does some magic transformation, and it becomes something like this. So it's an anonymous struct with a templated operator call that's taking an argument and then doing something. And this is the important part, because since the operator call is templated, it will only be instantiated if it's called. That's the important part. If we didn't have generic lambdas, we wouldn't be able to do this cleanly. So any questions so far? Uh, feel free to ask, because this is very important. Yes? OK, the question is, why would you use this very convoluted syntax instead of using a base foot class and maybe doing something more traditional? So this is just an example. I mean, uh, you, I wouldn't obviously write anything like this for such a simple class hierarchy. But when you're dealing with metaprogramming and when you're dealing with complex code, it's really, really nice to have a localized compiled branch inside a single function instead of jumping everywhere over the code. And maybe this is a, not uh, an excellent example, but it gives you an idea how you can uh, use different interfaces in the same function without having to use specialization and stuff like that. So yeah, you wouldn't do this for such a simple uh, example, but we'll see more examples in the code that might be more interesting. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, the question is, why do you consider not being able to do the crazy stuff you can do in D in C++? And maybe I, I didn't express myself very well. I don't consider that to be good inside C++ because it's kind of inconsistent with the rest of the language. But if I were using D, I really love the metaprogramming stuff you can do in D. I just think it doesn't fit with the rest of the language. Sure. So the question is, what if I wanted to disable the invalid specialization compile time and instead of printing, cannot consume? Just get rid of the else. That's it. <laughs> so let's anal analyze this technique step by step. The first step is obviously calling consume. So we're passing this value inside the function. And after that, we are going to look for a matching branch. So we start at the top of the if. And we test the condition. If it's false, we completely ignore the corresponding branch. And as soon as we find a real valid condition, then we don't care about anything else. We find our branch, we stop there, and this is what we're going to instantiate and call. So this is a very nice animation. Take a look at static if, and this is what happens. Everything, we don't care about that. We're just collapsing the whole construct into a single lambda call. So again. We found our matching condition. Everything else, we don't care about it. We got this lambda and this function call operator, and we're just going to you know, stick them together and call the lambda. So this is what happens. The argument we pass to consume will be passed to the call inside static if. And the static if call will forward that argument to the lambda. And then this is practically what we get. It's just the call inside the match branch. We don't care about anything else. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, FWD is just a macro for forward that I defined, which gets, uses the call type to get the types of the arguments so you don't have to specify that again. It's just a macro. So I have another question for you. Why don't we just capture the, the, the variable instead of you know, passing another one and calling it again? Does anybody know why? Exactly. So we cannot capture var uh, variables when using static if, because we need to defer instantiation to a later step. If we had captured the, the variable, the compiler would generate something like this. And since operator call is not templated, this will get immediately instantiated, and it will not compile, because obviously we cannot eat juice. We can only drink it. OK. So this was the slides part. We'll get into the code. and. 
see some more interesting examples, and then implementation of static if and iteration constructs. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay. So this is the example we just uh, seen in the, in the slides. I just wanted to make it complete. And as you can see, here we have our, our classes. Here we are defining our fake concepts, our manual concepts. And then inside consume, we have this static if construct, and we're calling all the different um, methods if it matches the branch. And our main looks like this. So we're just calling consume on instances of every kind of food. And if we, if we compile it, you can see that it compiles and it prints what we expect. So for banana, we're reading solid and liquid, solid, liquid, and for int and float, we cannot consume. If we add C++17, what you would write is much nicer, but it's conceptually the same. So this is what you would write in C++17. You write if const expert, the conditions, and you can just have health for the default case. And as you can see, we avoid a lot of noise, and we don't have two variables, we just have the x. And what the compiler does is it takes care of um, deferring the instantiation to a later step. So let's take a look at the implementation of static if. Firstly, we will define some interesting snippets and analysis and stuff that's useful. So this is this FWD macro that I was talking about. It's just a CD forward with decal type of the arguments of the macro and it's passing them inside decal type, uh, inside the forward call. I like this because it prevents you from having to repeat the the argument types, and it's also very nice when you're using generic lambdas, so you don't have to say decal type of x and then x again. It's just a simple macro. Then we'll define our bool compile time variables. So this is a type alias from C11, and this is a variable template from C14. If we define this, we don't have to call to instantiate the bool type. We can just say bool v with a value inside the angle brackets, and that's fine. In C++17, we'll have bool constant, which can be used to replace this alias over here. So my, my static if implementation was inspired by this article over here that you can check out later, and also by the comments on its Reddit thread and this following certificate core guidelines issue. So it's just a mix and match of everything that has been said there. And those are really interesting discussions, so I really advise you to check them out if you're interested. So the implementation is composed of three different things. We have an interface static if function that will take a predicate and we return an helper struct and then we can call and will trigger the whole uh, compile time branching stuff. We will have an helper struct called static if impl, which will allow to you to chain then and else and will eventually return a result when a, uh, when a branch is, fine, is found. And the result struct is another implementation details which will ignore all the other chaining calls and it will give you the operator call of the branch that you have matched and as soon as you have that operator call you can instantiate the lambda and call the function. So the interface function will be called static if and it will take a boolean constant as a parameter as you can see here. Instead of specifying the boolean directly in the template I'm using the type value encoding paradigm so I'm passing it as a value and then I can always check what the compile time value is because it's wrapped inside an integral constant. So that's a, that's a very powerful pattern. And after that, we will forward declare our implementation struct, which will take the result of the predicate. And this will be used, um, to, uh, this will be specialized depending on the result of the predicate. Afterwards, we have another struct that's called static if result, and it will be templated on the function to call, which is the branch that we're passing to static if. And we will actually use inheritance to expose the operator call of the function. And before we get, we get into the details, let's reiterate to make it hopefully clear. Static if impl will be returned by interface function, and every instance of this static if impl represents a single branch. The type will be specialized, as you, as you may recall, it's a, a bool template depending on whether or not the, temp the predicate is matched. Static if result will ignore all the subsequent chaining methods, will inherit from the lambda, which is our branch, and it will expose the operator call in order to allow you to call the matching branch. It will be returned by the true specialization of static if impl if a then branch is matched, or by the false specialization if an else branch is matched. So. 
I also have this uh, make static if resolve function here that allows you to do type deduction for the lambda, which is pretty nice, but we won't need it in C17 thanks to the constructor template argument uh, deduction, hopefully. And here we have the specialization of our implementation struct. So this will be instantiated when we find a matching true predicate. If we found that, we don't care about the else predicate, so we can just ignore it. We, we collapse it. If you remember the animation, it became transparent. We don't care about it. And we return the, um, the same structure that we're actually checking now. And the same for else if. So if the, if the branch is true, the predicate is true, we don't care about you know, anything that, that we implemented to catch the false branch condition. So what we care about is the fan, which contains the matching branch lambda. In this case, we, we, found, we finally found our condition and we can return a result with the lambda that we're going to call. And I'm just forwarding the lambda into the function, then we'll get something that exposes the call operator. For the false specialization, we don't care about then because the predicate is false. We only care about else and else if. So if we find else, we will just return a result because we don't have any other else if that we have to check. Otherwise, if we have else if, we will just return a new static if that will check that predicate. So it's kind of a, a chaining together multiple static ifs be, behind a very nice interface. And we also have to ignore operator call because as Jackie said, if we don't have a default case, we might actually have just an if and a then, and we, we are returning ourselves if we don't have um, another else. So we need to ignore any possible call to the to, to an unmatched branch. The static if result is what will be returned in, in the case that we find a matching branch or an else branch. And it's very simple. We're just getting our branch, which is the lambda. We are generating from it so that it exposes the call operator. And we're forwarding the, the branch inside ourselves in order to initialize the lambda. As soon as we find a result, we ignore everything because all we want to do is call that, that branch without you know, caring about the rest of the static if construct. And these are the syntactical sugar functions, which are very simple. This is just for type deduction to get the result. And this is just to get the predicate as a value to make a nice function-like interface. And this will instantiate the implementation by expanding the compile time integral constant to a compile time Boolean value. Everything clear so far? Feel free to ask questions. Okay, nice. So let's see some additional examples in the next, next code segment. Hopefully they will be more interesting than the previous one. So this is uh, something I had to encounter while coding a uh, generic data structure. I needed to have this grow function and keep track of how many copies and moves I was doing. And I wanted to check if the type I was copying to the new buffer was move constructible. So instead of having two separate functions and maybe using an able if or uh, a third party dependency, what I did is I have a single function. I put the static if directly inside the copying loop. I check if it's move constructible, then I increment my move counter and use std move explicitly. Otherwise, I increment my copy counter and you know just use a copy. So as you can see, this is very nice when you're writing generic code where, and you don't know the types. You can just put it inside your implementation function and it just works well and doesn't pollute your code with enable if and, and other stuff. I also think static if is extremely useful when writing compile time algorithms. Another thing I was doing for my thesis is uh, creating a compile time fold. And this is a left fold. And I wanted to control the recursion without having to specify all the parameters again and maybe have a different lambda or a different interface function. So what I did is I returned this fold function here, which you don't have to care about. The, the good part is that I'm using static if to control the recursion. So I'm checking if there are more items we have to fold onto. And if there are not, we can just return the base case. And this works very well at compile time without having an extra function that just avoids the, uh, the recursive case. You can think of this uh, like the variadic pack argument example that we've seen in the slides. It's slightly more complex and it's a compile time. But I think this is way cleaner than having uh, an explicit specialization and having to duplicate the function signature two times. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, to, again, 
being able to branch in an almost imperative way in compile time code is something that might be more familiar to programmers who are not experienced with functional programming. And I, it's, it can be subjective, but again, I really think it's cleaner in this context. Another common operation we do in imperative code is the for each loop. So is there a way we could implement that at compile time as well? And the answer is yes, obviously. So I'll start by analyzing this amazing for each argument snippet that Sean Parent posted on Twitter a few years ago. And I've analyzed it already as a bit 2015. It's a 30 minute talk dedicated to that, but I'll try to you know, be short and show you this cool snippet. The idea is that we have this function called for args that takes a callable object and a bunch of arguments. And what we want to do is call f on every single argument. So what do we do? We use a std initializer list of int, cast it to void, and inside that we call the function with the parameter pack by forwarding every single argument. Then we have the comma operator as zero, and we're expanding the things inside the initializer list. So this seems really contrived if you haven't seen the snippet before, but it's conceptually very simple. So the initializer list is here because we need a, a context where we can expand the variadic pack in order to have the left to right a guaranteed execution order. We are using, um, we're, we are calling the function on every single element here by forwarding the element as the argument of the function. But since our initializer list is of type int, we want this function call to evaluate to a valid int expression. So that's where, why we're using the comma operator here. And after evaluating every single call to an int expression, we're using the ellipsis operator to expand everything inside the initializer list. So in the end, the initialized list is just for 12 pass expand the function calls, and it's just an implementation detail. So if this is not clear, this is an example for, for arcs call, which is taking a callable object that will just forward the argument to see out. And here we're passing heterogeneous values. We have a string and a bunch of ints. And what we expect is to print hello123 to std out. And this roughly expands to this crazy thing over here. It's an initializer list, casted to void, containing four elements. And every element is a call of the callable object we passed with a comma and zero in order to um, evaluate it to a valid int. And since an, inside an initializer list, we're guaranteed to, be, to have a left to right evaluation order. This will do what we want. It will print hello123. And the comma operator will allow it to be valid at compile time because it's they are actually ints, so they can be inside the initializer list. And this is the same as writing a CD out hello one, two, three. So this is a zero overhead abstraction that you can use to call a function over an heterogeneous set of values. Just to show you a possible um, example, this is a call of the forex function with the same arguments as we've seen before. And if I compile that, hopefully it will print what we expect. L1, 2, 3, yes. In C++ 17, again, this will be much cleaner. This is the implementation in C++ 17. It's just a fold expression over the comma operator. And fold expressions guarantee left to right evaluation order. So that's all you need to do in order to call a function over a variadic pack. Sure question. Okay, so the, the question is that uh, they have a similar implementation of four args in their company, and what they do is they return f at the end of the function in order you know, to be more composable. And I agree with that, that's probably a better solution because it's similar to std for each or std that, that allows you, you know, to uh, mutate the functor and then do something after, so, yeah. So an alternative, a better alternative would be returning the, the, the callable object that you pass to four args. So if you want to learn more about fold expression, just go on CPP reference. It's a very concise and well-written page. And in the next code segment, we'll exploit for args for compile time iteration. So this is how it looks like without comments. And you can see why it fits in a tweet. It's very short, very concise, and very cryptic. So uh, this is an example I came up with. Let's say we have a template called buffer that is templated over a number of bytes, and we can allocate and deallocate the buffer. 
this totally valid allocation in the allocation code. And we will write to run some tests with different amounts of bytes without having to write a lot of repetition and you know, just have a nice for loop. So if we had a runtime buffer where we can allocate the number of bytes at runtime, this is what you would write. You would have a range four over a, a set of numbers. You will allocate a buffer, you will perform a test and then deallocate. This is very clean, very straightforward. In order to do data compile time, we need to generate this code somehow. So for args, can help, to, can help us doing that. If you remember our previous static implementation, we used something similar to bool constant to wrap a Boolean value inside a compile time wrapper. We can do the same with numbers. We can have a size t integral constant and its own concepts variable template, and we can wrap a value inside uh, this concept value. This way, we can actually iterate using for args over our values here, and every single SZV instantiation is a different type that will contain the, the size t value. And inside our function here, we can just call buffer angle brackets, whoops, angle brackets with n, and it will unwrap the value for us and instantiate it at compile time with the correct amount of bytes. So this is not as clean as the runtime test, but it's very similar conceptually. You just have a bunch of values you are iterating over, and for every value, you're doing something in compile time, which is instantiating a buffer with that amount of bytes and allocating, deallocating, and performing your test. So it's not as pretty as the runtime version, but if you want to make it prettier, you can use some additional abstractions and maybe have a four values function here that takes a bunch of values. It will wrap them for you inside an integral constant and then do, do something with a callable object. So is this pattern clear to everyone about what? Yeah, sure, question. Okay, the question is, why do you need this uh, compile time SZV wrapper instead of passing the integers directly? So if you pass the integers directly and you lose the compile time information about the value of the integer, it's just an int. You don't have that information at compile time. What we want to do is not pass an int, but an, an eight, a 16 and 32 at compile time. In order to do that, we need to capture that information and wrap into something that can hold it at compile time and then we can unwrap it later. So if you pass hate here, when you get here inside the lambda and you try to instantiate buffer, it will not work because this is like runtime information. It's not a val valid compile time value. If it's not clear yet, think of it uh, in terms of types. What if you wanted to instantiate a buffer with a specific type? You need like to wrap the type inside another like type constant and then pass it to the buffer. Okay. Let's move forward and we'll see an example of using static if and for args together. So let's say that we have, as, as we were just saying, we want to iterate over different types. And what we can do is define our own type wrapper, which will be a simple template struct over here containing the type. And we'll also define a concepts variable template that will allow us to pass it around as a value. So what we're doing, we're wrapping a type inside of a value. And this is an empty value. It's really nothing at runtime. It's just a wrapper for us to play with at a compile time. And we'll also have this kind of utility meta function called unwrap that will take a wrapped type and it will unwrap it for us. And this is how you can use it. Imagine you have a tuple of vectors, which is a set of buffers, and you want to do something on every buffer all at once. Maybe if you had C++17, you would use std apply in order to apply the, the tuple inside a function and do something with that. But another approach is just iterating over the types, getting the corresponding buffer from the tuple, and performing an action over that. And we can do that with for args. So these are uh, for args call here, where we're passing um, a variadic amount of wrapped types, because if you remember, those are actually values. Those are empty values, but they contain compile time information important for us. And every single type is going to get passed inside the lambda, so it's going to take the value of t. When we, have, when we are inside the lambda body, we can unwrap the type and get the real t, which in this case is int, float, or double. And after that, we can use std get to get the corresponding vector and maybe resize it or do something on it. So as you can see, by wrapping values into types and by wrapping types into values, you can iterate over numbers, types, or whatever you want at compile time. And I think this is really powerful because it doesn't look too far off from a, 
a runtime loop. And again, the same concept as static if applies. It's localized, easier to reason about, and easier to read, in my opinion. If you combine this functionality with static if, you can have really powerful and simple algorithms. Let's say we have uh, two functions, one to initialize a small object storage and one to initialize a big object storage. And we want to check at compile time whether or not uh, a set of types is bigger than a certain threshold and switch upon the threshold in order to initialize a small or a big storage. So what we will do is have these four args here. We have a bunch of types over here. As you can see, we have an int, float, double, and an array. And inside the four args uh, lambda body, we can unwrap our type, check if the unwrap type is matching our threshold, and in this case, either initialize the small object storage or the big object storage. So by combining, combining these two constructs together, you can get really clean compile time algorithms and code that, you know, it's pretty easy to read. It's just like the runtime version, but this is all happening at compile time. So for, for args is very, very cool, but it has some annoying limitations. It's not possible to get the current iteration index easily. You need to pass it alongside your arguments. It's, uh, it is also not possible to produce a result value, and there are no break and continue equivalents to the compile time version. So what we're going to implement is another version of static iteration called static4, which will be internally implemented in C14 and will allow you to do all of those things. Static4, compared to four args, will indeed add the ability to get the current iteration index as a compile time number. It will give you the possibility to produce an output value, so an accumulator, and it will allow you to break and continue out of the loop quite easily. So if you are familiar with functional programming, this is just a glorified fault. The idea is that we're trading off compilation times in order to use a recursive implementation so that we can have all this nice sugar, uh, because with four arcs, we get the ellipsis operator, so it's expanded by the compiler, which is very quick. But if we want to do this stuff, we need to recurse. So it's going to be a little more impactful on compile times, but it's more powerful. So those are two alternatives, depending on what you want to do. So before diving into the implementation, let's see a very contrived example that will show you everything that we can do with static4. So we will write a static for that will accept any number of compile time numerical values. It will accumulate the numbers and return a result at compile time. So the sum of all numbers in a compile time wrapped value. And it will print every even number and iteration index. And will, it will immediately break when we find this strange sentinel value, which is minus 999. So the idea is the static, wor static for works by passing its current state as a parameter to the, uh, to the loop body every iteration. And you can query this state to get the current iteration, the next action that will, be, will happen, which is either continue or break. And you can also access the accumulator variable that you can override with your new value inside the for loop body. So this is how it looks like. We have the static for function. And the body is a lambda that will take two parameters. The first one is the state of the static four. And the second one is the current argument we're iterating upon. And since GCC doesn't really like when we use state and x inside a context, constant, uh, context sorry, we need to um, use this kind of weird pattern where we take the type of the state and immediately instantiate it in order to get a context value. Clang does not force you to do this, but it's just a workaround in order to take this value and convert it to something that, I can be, that you can use at compile time. And we are not losing any information because everything is in the compile time wrapper. So there is nothing we're losing by reinstancing the type again. So we can also assign names to our predicates. So the must break predicate is when the rx is equal to the weird sentinel value that we chose. And the even predicate is obviously when x um, when the remainder of x and 2 is 0. Now we can check if we have to break. And if we have to break, we will use a return state.break. So we need, to, we need a way of telling the for iteration that we want to break immediately. So we're going to return this special value that will be caught by the implementation and we will stop iterating. Otherwise, we will have another psyche here that We'll check if the number is even, and if it's even, we will print something to the std out, and that will be the iteration, the current index of the four, which is stored inside the state. 
and the number itself. Otherwise, uh, we will continue iterating and we will increase our accumulator with the current value. So all of this is a lot to take in, but I wanted to show you an example that uses every possible feature of static 4. And in the end, this is just a very glorified fold that has a lot of syntactical sugar for you to use. Inside the loop body, it, you can see that we can also produce runtime side effects. So this is not a purely compiled time construct. You can get a compile time result, but while you're iterating, you can also produce and generate code that will be run at runtime. So in this case, we're printing stuff and also getting a compile time accumulated value that you can use in other compile time algorithms. The above code is slightly equivalent to this runtime generator. So what we're doing is we're catching an accumulator and binding it. This is our initial value. Then we're returning a variadic lambda that takes a bunch of values. And for every value, we are doing the same thing we were doing in the static for. We're breaking on our sentinel value. We're keeping track of the iteration. And we're printing if the number is even. And we're accumulating the value and incrementing the iteration. As you can see, this is way easier to read. But conceptually, it's the same control flow. So we have the same structure for a static for and a runtime for. The price we have to pay is obviously syntactical clarity. But if you know how to write a compile, uh, sorry, a runtime for, you know how to write a compile time for. And that's the point of this, of this talk. So uh, we actually are using carring here to make it a lot more flexible. The first call to static four will take the body of the lambda and simply return a wrapper that wrap that body so we can call it multiple times. The second call will take an initial accumulator and will not yet call the will not start yet start the iteration. So this is just binding the body and binding the accumulator. And we can set this aside and we can call it multiple times with different argument packs. Finally, the third call will have our own body. We'll have the initial accumulator and we'll have the variadic pack. And this is where the iteration will start over this body with this initial accumulation value. So we do it this way because it's a lot more flexible. Let's say that you want to call the same body with the same accumulation value multiple times with different argument packs. You can just bind those and then call the result of that with different arguments. So it's pretty powerful. As an example, we are taking our print even accumulate function that was the example we've seen before. And we're binding the initial zero value to the accumulator in this variable over here. And then we can call this variable with a bunch of values multiple times. And the result of that will be a compile time value that will sum all these types together. And you know, it will do the usual logic of breaking if we get our sentinel value and it will print even numbers. So as an example, I'm calling both the compile time version of the loop and the runtime version of the loop and just checking if the values they return are the same in order to make sure that the control flow logic is the same. We can compile that and hopefully it will work. Okay, yes, as you can see, we get the even number printed in both versions and we get the same compile time and runtime result. The important thing is that you can use this compile time result, which is the accumulation of the value in any other compile time algorithm because it's wrapped inside uh, an integral constant. While in the runtime value, you lose obviously the compile time information. So we will implement static for from scratch in the next code segment. Before we do that, I want to make sure that it is clear what's happening. So if you have any question or any doubt, please feel free to ask. Sure. Uh, so the question is, could you use fault expressions? Okay. Uh, no, you couldn't use fault expressions because you have no way of breaking out of it and also no way of um, getting the iteration index. If you think about it, the previous code snippet, the for arc snippet, is actually a fault expression in C++ 17. So that's the trade-off you have to pay. You either use uh, something that gets expanded by the compiler directly and it's very fast at compile time, or you use a recursive solution that allows you to do more stuff, basically. Sure. Is there the question is, is there any way this could generate really crappy runtime code? No. I did as a, I tested uh, compiling to assembly and uh, with um, optimization level one for GCC and optimization level two for Clang, it completely goes away. It's just like generating code. It's very nice. Sure. 
So the question is, <laughs> if you, are the errors you get with this clear? No, they are horrible. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the implementation. I think it's more straightforward than for ARCS1 if you're familiar with recursion and compiled algorithms. So what we're using is a state class that keeps track of the current iteration, the current accumulation value, and the next action we will perform. So it's like a switch. We either break or continue. And the iteration will be tracked using an integral constant. As you should know, this is now our pattern. Every number we use at compile time, we have to wrap it. The accumulator will be provided by the user code by the second call so that we can bind an initial accumulator and then work with it. And the next action will be implemented using two empty tag tracks. So we're going to tag what the loop is going to do in the next iteration, either break or continue. Uh, we also need to iterate the compile time and this can be implemented using recursion. And I'm gonna use lambdas to recurse, which is pretty cool. So the action classes are over here. They're just implementation details in a hidden namespace. They are empty tag classes. And we will just use SCD same to check if we want to continue or break inside the implementation of the for loop. The state class is a templated class that will store our iteration, our accumulator, and our action. Now we need to know all of those values at compile time, so it needs to be a template. But we also want syntactical sugar that will allow the user to grab them very easily. So we define constexpr auto um, methods that will instantiate the template value and return it. And this is very nice because we're using C14 type deduction, so we don't have to uh, specify the type ourselves. And it, 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 the compiler can usually automatically convert it to a runtime value. So like if we're using SCDC out with the iteration value, there's no need to unwrap it manually. The compiler will do that for you. So it's pretty convenient. Now we also have to define two methods, one to continue and one to break. And as you can see here, I have two overloads because we might want to continue with the same accumulation value without mutating it, or we might want to uh, give the static for a new accumulation value in order to pass it forward to the next iteration. So depending on what you want to do, you either want to pass a new accumulator or just uh, use the current one. And these methods here will change the action inside the state so that the next iteration we will check using static if whether or not we need to continue or break. In order to simplify the management of the state, I created this make state function and this advanced state function. And the make state function will probably not be needed in C++ 17, but all it does here is just take the values by regular parameters for the function so that we can deduce the types and it will just instantiate that state. The advanced state will just take the current state, uh, an accumulation value, and, then, and the next action. It will just increment the iteration for you very easily. So one thing you, that might be interesting here is that when you want to increment a compile time value, you need to wrap it again because when we're doing this plus one over here, we're going back to the runtime realm. So we want to wrap all that into the compile time realm again. So we use SSV. If you had your own integral constant implementation, which is what Boost Hana does, you can overload the plus operator for two integral constants and you will do the wrapping and unwrapping inside the implementation of the over operator overload. So it's a lot cleaner, but you need a lot of boilerplate that didn't fit on the slides, on the code writer. Uh, okay, let's implement the state methods. So for continue, what we want to do is just advance the state with our current state and either give you uh, a new accumulator that was provided by the user or the current accumulator and we're going to signal the for recursion loop that we want to continue and not actually break. The break function is pretty much the same. If we don't want to have a new accumulator, we just pass the, uh, our current one, and we want to signal the for body that we want to break instead of continuing. The next piece of the implementation, which is the most complex one, is the recursive lambda that is used to actually uh, execute the loop. And as you can see, this is wrapped inside a static for function that will bind our body. So this is the first call of the function. And here we're binding our body by forwarding the body inside the lambda. So we're capturing it. And this lambda call step will be called multiple times with every argument at compile time. And in order to recurse with lambdas, we need to use this weird pattern where we pass the lambda to itself because we don't have information about the lambda 
until we call it. So if you were doing this at runtime, you might use a std function because a std function erases the type and allows you to recurse inside the lambda. But since we cannot use that at compile time, we need to pass the lambda to itself in, in order to recurse. This is kind of weird, but it does make sense if you think about it. Then we need to pass the current state to the lambda, the current argument that we are iterating over, and the rest of the arguments. Inside the step body, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the next state immediately. And how do we compute the next state? We call the body function that we captured earlier with the current state and the current x argument. So the next state will tell us whether or not we had to break, what the new accumulation value is, and it might generate code. Um, we also need to check if this is the last iteration we're doing by checking if we have any remaining argument in the argument pack. That's very easy to do. We just check uh, the size of the argument pack with the size of ellipsis operator and wrap that into a compile time value. That's very important. Now we need to make sure that if the user is going to call break in the next state, we want to immediately break. So we don't, have, we don't want to generate an extra step of code or modify the accumulator value for an extra step. So what we are going to do is checking if we must break by using std same with the type of the next action in the next state and comparing that to the break action. So if in the next state the user is going to call break, we want to recognize that at compile time by using decal type on the next state. We check what the type of this action will be and if it will be break, we set this value here to a compile time boolean true value in order to avoid going an extra step in our static floor. Now it's time to deal with recursion. If you remember the previous example a few code segments ago, I used static if to recurse inside a lambda for a fold, and this is basically the same thing. What we're implementing is a syntactical sugar for a left fold. So what we want to do is static if to control the recursion. If we have to break because the user wanted us to immediately break, or if we are the last iteration, this is our final step or base case. We are going to return the current accumulator and that's it. Otherwise, what we want to do is recurse. And this is the very cool thing about lambdas. You can pass the lambda to itself in order to allow recursion without knowledge of the type of the lambda at compile time. And we can also pass the next state and the rest of the arguments ignoring the current argument. So this is a lot to take in, but I hope it's kind of clear what we're doing. If the user wants to break, or if we have no more argument, just return the accumulation value. Otherwise, we call ourselves. This x self will be basically the step function with the new state and the rest of the arguments. So that was the step function. Now we want to return something that allows the user to bind an accumulator to the state function. And to do that, we move the step function inside an extra lambda that will be returned. And this lambda will just take the initial accumulation value, bind it, and we'll provide the user with another function that will take a bunch of arguments and iterate over those arguments using the bound accumulation value and the bound loop that's going to be used for the static for. And what we need to do here is we need to explicitly check if the user is passing an empty parameter pack because uh, otherwise we will get a compile time er uh, error during the instantiation of the step lambda. And so if the user is passing no arguments, we'll just immediately return the accumulator. Otherwise, we start our iteration with an initial state uh, that begins from the zero iteration index from the bound user provider accumulator and with the continue action by default. Once we have all of that, we can finally call step with the initial state and forward it via the argument pack. And we can actually invoke static if with our step and our argument pack. So throughout this talk, what I've been doing is just defining uh, x and y's. The, the reason I do this is to allow the deferring of the static if branch matching at compile time. So if you see xs here and ys here, it's just because I'm calling static if and passing it back to the static if in order to allow um, template instantiation to take place only if the branch is matched. So we can test our implementation. This is an example call. We're using static for with our body over here. And this will just bind the body. After binding the body, we bind an initial accumulation value. So this is a second function call. And the final function call will execute the loop and give us our 
accumulate a result. So if we analyze the body, what we're doing is we're printing everything um, at the beginning of the loop. Then we are computing our new accumulation value by taking the old one over here and incrementing it with the, with the value that we're iterating over and wrapping all of that inside a compound time constant. Again, this decal type stuff, it's required because of GCC for some reason. So if you use Clang, it's way nicer. And after that, we will return uh, the continue action from our state with the new accumulation value. So this is just a sum over the elements of the static four with an initial zero value. If we compile that, we should get the sum of 10, 20, 30, and 40. Oops. Okay. okay, as you can see, we get every iteration value, and sorry, iteration index and current value printed, and the current value of the accumulator so we can track what the four is doing. And again, the point of this construct is that it's conceptually the same as a runtime four in terms of control flow and how you would think about it. The difference is the horrible syntax, but that's just what we have to do for now. Sure, question. Exactly. So the question or comment was, what is inside the for loop is code that will be generated at runtime, which is directly in the body, and this will be the code that we're generating. In order to compute stuff at compile time, we're exploiting uh, argument passing to the recursive lambda and returning values that have sp special like compile time sentinels that will tell us whether or not we have to accumulate and to continue and break. Is that right? Okay, perfect. So, yeah, sure. So the code that you're generating would just be for CLs? Exactly. It's all no overhead at runtime, just for CLs. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, you're using recursion to break out of the loop. What if you capture the state as a mutable lambda value and you directly like assign break to it during the body? Is that what you're asking? You're thinking in the, in the runtime realm because you can do that at runtime, but if you're assigning it inside the body, we are not really changing any, anything at the compile time. We need a way... We, but the lambda is not context proof. It, it might work in C++. Okay, I see what, you, what you're getting to. Maybe in C++17 where we have contextual lambdas, we could do this in a cleaner way. But in C++14, since we do not have contextual lambdas, I don't think you can use runtime-like syntax to control the iteration. We, we might try in C++17. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay. The point. So yeah. The question is, how did you get away uh, without specifying the explicit return type of the lambda using recursion? I just use auto because, as you said, I'm passing the lambda into itself, so I don't need to know what the lambda is going to do or is going to return or the or the type of the lambda itself during uh, the development of the, of the for loop, since I can exploit the uh, type deduction here, as you can see, when I'm recursing, I'm just using return self, calling self again over and over, but the return type is known in the base case of the recursion. So in the end, the auto that you see here, 
is the type of the lambda, which we do not care about. The thing we care about is the return, like the, the base case of the recursion, and we are aware of that type in the static key here, which is the base step. So I, I understand your question, but uh, you don't need to know the, like, the recursive type of the lambda to implement lambda recursion if you use this pattern. What you need to know is just what the type of the value you're going to return is, and you can deduce that from the accumulator in this case or anything else. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so the comment was, it's not actually a real recursive function. You're calling a different function every iteration, and that's completely correct. I just like to think it in terms of recursion because, you know, it's, it's practically what we're doing, but yeah, it's not the same function. We're just generating a new one and calling it every time. Any more comments? Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, let me check what the other, Okay, let's go very quickly through this. This is my conclusion. And in the GitHub repository where I, that I showed you the link at the beginning of the talk, I have the assembly generated for G++ 5.3, 6.1, and Clang++ 3.7, 3.8. And they produce identical assembly for unwritten code and static for, for args or static if, uh, starting from these optimization levels onwards. So this is effectively a zero cost abstraction. You might pay in terms of compile time a co compilation time impact, depending on whether or not you know, you, you're using a very big static for that uses recursion or a lot of static ifs. If you want a production ready solution, you can check out Boostana. I cannot stress this enough. This is a beautiful library that makes metaprogramming amazing. And uh, it provides some evil if constructor, which you can use to implement the same pattern as you can see here. You just have a compile time um, condition here and a bunch of lambdas that represent the various instantiation depending on whether or not you're matching the compile time branch. Also, it provides a for each here that takes a tuple instead of a variadic uh, amount of arguments, and it will apply the, the tuple inside the pass function, so you can achieve the same thing as for args of static for without the iteration index and all of the other syntactical sugar. Another cool library is PolFolks' fit, which is a modern functionality library, and you have something similar to static if, which is called evil and conditional. By composing evil and conditional together and using that special if object, you can implement the same thing as static if, and this is a production ready solution. It's a different syntax, different approach, but it does the same thing, basically. Also, you can use fit compress and fit apply to create a callable object that will call a specific function over a set of arguments. And instead of passing them as a variadic set, you just call it multiple times. And you can use metaprogramming facilities to make this nicer and equivalent to static 4. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much for attending. If